because actually, to be honest, most of the architects, they do, they, they know how the temples look like, but they don't really understand how the architecture works. And there are, and here we have this kind of design, yeah, first time like a design system that you can actually call style if you want, because it has like something like rules in it. And there are basically two, one is the Doric and one is the Ionian. I will explain in a second what it is. And you will not design that so detailed in your life, probably like those, but it's good to understand principles because as I tried to point out before, these systems, it's always, an architecture is always about understanding systems. So the systems are able and capable to design many building types and functions as you will see later. So actually in the 19th century, I tried to point that out in my first lecture I gave you two weeks ago. In the 19th century, when new building types came up, for example, hospitals or schools, universities, more public buildings. Also, I showed you an example of a train station. So of course, a new type or subway stations. It was actually this, they use actually this kind of classic system as I try to explain you now. So the system of the Greek architecture was used sometimes formally, but sometimes just as a principle to design many new building types, even train station and subway stations. And it actually worked. So in the 19th century, between 1800 something, and let's say in between 18 and 1900, roughly, that's a 19th century, right? It was proven that this system is capable to manage a lot of building types and typologies and requirements. So it actually works. So that's why I want to teach you how the system works. And we have to separate, yeah, I start with a formal system. So in this case, you can actually indeed talk for, uh, about a style if you want. So I start with an overview of styles or systems. So this one you can find on Wikipedia if you type column types. But <clears throat> Yeah, I don't really like the term style in architecture because it, it looks like 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 when you go to H&M and you can choose this type of pants together with that shirt or another type of pants with another shirt and they call it style. But in this case, it really makes sense because it it's usually it starts with the column, so the vertical element to bring the forces from the roof into the ground, basically. So the column is the main element and it starts and that is then stylistically developed and connected with something called entablature. The whole part on the top that has a, has a lower part called architrave and the upper part called frieze. And on the left, you see the Greek Doric. So this is the, the, the first three. Actually, I would really like to explain you on the whiteboard, I mean, in the classroom, but since many of you are still, or some of you are still up country, as I was told by Satakon, that's why we do it online now. This part of the lecture, I would really like to have a pen and a, and a whiteboard. But um, so on the left side of that slide, you see slide two, by the way, I hope. I hope so. Oh, no, it's not locked. Can you see slide two? No, you cannot. It's not. I didn't lock it. Why you don't complain when you don't see slide two? Uh, I lock it. So now, can you see slide two now? I can see. Yeah. Okay, there was one. Duncan and who else sees slide two now? Yes, I see it. <laughs> yeah, Fatif, I know. And who else? There's what two? Parinda, are you here? Can you see slide two? Parinda sleeping. Unop, can you see slide two? If you're all absent, I don't need to lecture. I mean, that is pointless. Yes, I can see it. I, tr I trust that you are there. Parinda, Tanapat, are you? Uh, Tanapat, I asked before. Nawapon, are you there? Yes. No. Uh, yes. Okay, I hope that you all see that. So that's slide two. That's an overview of columns. I, I uploaded the PowerPoint again on, the, on MS Teams, so you can, yeah. But you should pay attention, otherwise, without my words, you probably can't understand it. So this, this overview is from Wikipedia, but it's quite good. And on the left side, you see the Greek Doric. So if you want, call it style. The, the official word would be order. So the Doric order. I don't know what it orders. It doesn't really order, but it, it's, uh, it's a connection between a column and an entablature. And you see the development already from the early heavy times that I show you, like the Zeus Temple. 
on the left, it has a quite short column and very heavy entablature. And it becomes slimmer and more light. Like the middle one is the Parthenon, the second temple that I show you. Like quite much higher. And then the third one is a later one from the what we call Hellenistic time. So after Alexander the Great has conquered that area. More slim, more light, but more elegant. So it doesn't have that monumental heavy form, but I like the later ones more, like the third ones more light. So that's a Doric form. And then the three ones next to it is called the Ionian style or order, Ionian order. And that actually developed not really on the mainland, but yeah, it developed actually where's today Turkey and in the Ionian area. But it was then also merged. So they, they also built uh, Ionian temples also on the Acropolis in Athens is a small called Nike temple like nike like the shoe brand it's actually the god of winning that's why the shoe brand is called nike like the god of winning a small temple in the union order too so and the other buildings too so so they, they didn't build it on one only in the in the west today turkey but it comes from there and the columns are more slim they have a different types of uh, these kind of caneluans so also these these engravings they look different as you see on the top and they have these kind of very typical two roundish voluten volutes i think in english and it's it's actually like later like in the renaissance they call it the feminine style so they call the doric like looks very they said looks manly and strong so it was the masculine style that was what the people later said about it maybe already in roman empire i'm not sure at least around 1500 they call it the doric the manly one and the ionian the feminine ones, so like a lady, more slim, that the columns were higher, slimmer, more kind of more elaborated, more fragile. And the entablature looks as you can see. So the architrave is like, this is the lower part of the, of this kind of big beam. This symbolizes the real beam. This has, has this kind of uh, division. And then comes the frieze. Uh, this, this doesn't have this typical ornament like in the Doric one. And there are variations about it. So it's not so strict, but it has this kind of system. So these are the three, number four to six on that slide. And then on the right side, you see what they call them the third one nowadays. So nowadays, when you have somebody asks you how many column, they call it orders, orders or systems they have. They usually say three. That's not really correct. But um, actually, I would say it's five. But I'll explain that soon, why it's five or even six. Um, this is basically just the top part, the capital was exchanged with something they probably derived out of a basket of leaves. So people say that because it's uh, the, the leaves are called acanthus, so the flowers called acanthus, it are the two right uh, columns on that slide. So they basically exchanged the hat with, uh, with these roundish volutes to, to this, this to this kind of basket imitation carved in stone and they kept the same entablature the entablature is the same system just more rich so it's kind of more developed it's seen as the highest style so when you see this as a row they see like the left is maybe the, the oldest the more archaic one but also the, the basis so later in roman empire they build them over each other what they didn't do in greece not really they started doing it but in roman they make it systematic so the first floor has the doric over it is the more light one, the Ionic, and the third floor has the Corinthian. If you have more, this, so the right one is called Corinthian. So when you have more than three stories, you have a problem, and you usually add another one that I explain later under the Doric, and there's also one over the Corinthian. But these are the three main ones. So the last, last left three, Doric, Ionic in the middle, and then basically just the, the head of the column was exchanged. So it's also called capital same like the capital uh, in a city is, um, as you see, double as a double height as the Ionic, Ionian one. So Ionian has a proportion of kind of slightly one to two, right? It's horizontal. And the Corinthian one on the right side has a proportion of one to one. So it's an elevation square. That's why the column becomes higher. As you see them, this column, what is it there? Seven and six and seven, if you combine them, uh, uh, compare them, the height of the 
of the real column is the same, but just the top part is higher. So the whole system become higher and more slim. And later they made that to a system. So they, they, they give proportions. And proportions are always based on the lower diameter of the column. Yeah, now I need a whiteboard again to draw that. Um, so the diameter of the column, it means that the, the dimension, the yeah, diameter, right, of the circle at the bottom of the column is the start measure for the whole system, for everything. So you always start with that. And that's why you can also scale it. So you always set it as one. You see the lower diameter of the lowest column in the building when you start like in a three-story building, it's the first floor, is uh, dimension one. And then you multiply it. So actually the column becomes slimmer to the top. It, it, it usually reaches 85% uh, of the lower diameter. So it's 0.85. Um, that's a normal, they call entasis, so they make the column slimmer to look stronger, and that's the same for all orders, so they all become slimmer. But it's more obvious in the Greek one because the columns are shorter, so you can see on the very left one, uh, it has a proportion of probably 1 to 3.5, the height, right, so very, very heavy. The right one is probably 1 to 8, the height, but the, the slimness is the same, so it usually reaches, yeah, no, no, like, Exactly, but usually 0 0.85, so 85 per, 85% of the lower diameter, so it becomes a bit slimmer. And that's why when you build another column on top, you start with 0 0.85, and then it develops to 0 0.6 something. So, but that's, that's, that's what I call system. So, yeah, here you see the main columns, and then something happened in the Roman Empire on my next slide. Oh, so, yeah, first the Greek ones, I have them in a zoom, I didn't know that. <laughs> zoom in, yeah, here you see the, um, the detailed ones. So you see how they they become also the the the, the capitals so the top of the column became yeah as you see here in the development first it was like a big like a strong pillow the word is the echinus there so it's really very fat and it looks more also more ancient for me kind of more archaic so it looks rougher and it's very big and it becomes like quite a slim part. As you see on the right side, everything becomes more strict and elegant. This happened in the classic time. So the development that you see is between 500 and 332. So at the end of classic period, they reached this system like as you see on the right side. <coughs> and through the Hellenistic time, so after Alexander the Great took over, they kind of kept this system. So, and the Doric column doesn't have a base, so it just stands on... Yeah, either the ground, or, I mean, the ground was lifted, so there were some, like, stairs under the temple. But um, is the column itself doesn't have a base. Typical elements, they have names, and if I was an art historian, I will not force you to learn the names of these elements. So, but for me, it's just enough when you know that they symbolize, actually, the head of the beam. As I said, the theory is that this derived out of wooden construction, so... In the wood, you have the architrave, that's a horizontal beam in that direction. And then you have beams in another direction, right? And, and these kind of, um, called tri triglyphen in, in, in Greek, these kind of parts should symbolize the head of the beams. Of course, they're not used anymore for anything in stone construction. When you do it in stone, you could make it all blank. And I actually later in 18th, 19th century, they did it blank. But these are the typical decoration elements, these triglyphs. And the other one um, called metopas, the, the, the space in between. So this typical entablature design is, is really typical. In this case, you can really call it style. So it's a style that related to the Doric style and to the Doric column. So it's a combination of entablature and column that in this case is called order, or if you want to call it style, you, it's, yeah, I think you can call it Doric style if you want. So that's how it developed. And then that's my next slide. Like four. In Roman Empire, they sometimes left away these kind of uh, cannulas, so these kind of vertical engravings in the column. I like it more like that. It looks a bit more pure, but maybe like modern architects, like everything pure. And this is what the, door, uh, the Romans made out of it. So the left one, they call it Toscanic order or Tuscan or um, what's the other word? Uh, um, Etruscan order also. Is another one was added, which is more pure, more rough than the Doric one. So another lower one. If you have like four stories, you can add that under that four-story building. 
And then that's what they made. You see on the second column from the left what the, what the Romans made out of the Doric order. You see it also on the right side. So they put actually a base under it. And um, they, they changed the, the column and make it more slim than the Greek did. And it has a base. It doesn't have the cannulus anymore. It has a changed capital. So it has a changed top. And the, the proportion of the entablature changed also. So it, it became like a more fancy design. It didn't have so much to do with this kind of heavy construction appearance that the early temples, like the Zeus temple, have. But it looks for me more um, bourgeois, so more, more, more civilized, kind of a bit more like it could be in the city, right? The other one is really like temple in the nature, and this like looks, um, yeah, it's kind of more developed. So that's what the Romans on the right side is a Roman building. The Romans took over after they took over Greece around between 200 and, and the year zero, let's say. I think 60 after Christ, 60 after Christ, the year 60, they took over whole Greece, I think. Then they finally cover, um, conquered Athens as the last city. I think it was 60. I'm not sure. Um, so in these 200 years, they took over Greece and also took over their style elements. So this kind of Doric order changed to that one. So that's why in the architecture theory around 1500, they separate between the Greek Doric and the Roman Doric order. So they, they yeah, say the, D, the Greeks the Doric order like that and the Romans like that. And then they also took over the Ionian and if it evolu and there's an evolution, they, they develop it to what you can see in the middle of the left slide. <laughs> The, the middle column on the left part of the slide and the Corinthian one. And it also happened to combine to make the Corinthian with this ab abacus leaves combined with the volutes from the from the Ionian and became this what they call composition order or composite. So that's on the right. So you now you have five. These are five orders, right? And so that's what the Roman did. And this is I find a great overview <coughs> of that first so I uploaded two books for you. And the homework is actually to study these books briefly. I mean, I will not, yeah, it, it kind of, I will not, not test next week because uh, Ajahn Kuba is studying next week. So I will not test that you read them, but I really recommend to have a look, especially in the first one. I uploaded both these books that I use in this lecture um, in, in, in MS Teams already. So the first one you see the title here is from Robert Chithams from England, I think 1980s, so 1985 or something, 82. So just like 20, 30 years ago, he studied all these systems because he want to understand the system, how it works. And um, he made quite an effort. And that book is really great. It's not thick. It's, it has an original. I have the original one in, in my library in Germany. It has a DNA4 format. DNA4 and just like 60, 70 pages. So it's quite thin. It's more, it's a very small booklet. And it's very lovely. And he draw what you see there is drawn by him. So it's called the classic orders of architecture. And it starts with the columns, but then develop to a design system. And the second book is the Durand, and I uploaded both. The Durand, I took out some pages because it's super large, but I uploaded the main ones. They're both in the MS Teams and the task and the homework for next week is to have a look on these books. And I mean, I just recommend to, to study them. They're really both really good. So here you see the five main orders. And this is a version that Chitham, as an architect, so he's an architect from the 20th century, 1980s, developed. So he studied previous systems show you in a second. So they look, for example, like this. These are diff different Doric versions, how it can be. Slide six, I go back to slide five. There he made like the ideal one for all five. So the Tuscan is the roughest one that comes from the Etruscan. It was the countryside north of Rome, which was then conquered by Roman Empire, kind of at one of the first invasions. They, they integrated the Etruscan culture, also the the dome, the, the, the ways to build domes and arcs come from them. And they, they took this kind of very simple column called Tuscan order. Uh, that's the area north of Rome. And then the Doric is a derival from the Greek. As you see there already, it's, he shows only the Roman Doric order. There's the other way would be the Greek Doric one. And he adds like a big basis under it. So he adds, so first of all, the, the column is round, right? And then it has a roundish part of the base. And this turns into a squared base called abacus, so a small plate where it stands on. Uh, yeah, and then he adds here another basis under the column, which you can do, but you don't have to. So some buildings do it, 
from 15th century on. So the, the later architecture took over Greek elements and some don't. So can do both. And then you have the entablature and these different styles. It's basically the Doric one and this typical one and the Ionian one. As I said, when you have questions, you can ask or you can interrupt me again, okay? If you don't understand that. I would love to draw that on the whiteboard and, and construct it with you together, but now I can just show you the slide. Even when I draw with my mouse, it will be not precise enough when I draw on the whiteboard function. But So it starts with a lower diameter, and all the numbers left and right you see are based on the lower, the diameter of the column, where the column starts and the base. So it's called lower diameter. So it's always one, and then you see they become higher. So he made either the Tuscan one to seven, the Roman Doric would be one to eight, the Greek Doric starts with one to 3.5, so it's very short, and develops to around one to 5.5, so maybe one to six or seven in the later empire, but not higher, and the Roman Doric is very slim, one to eight, you see there, and then he write the numbers there also. Ionic one, he made one to nine, you have a system, and the Corinthic one actually would be one to 9.5, because the capital is double height of the, of the rest, so it should be 1 to 9.5, but he want to make a system, and, and this system is also done by many other architects in the classic times, uh, which is, uh, so I mean, the, the times when they kind of reused the Greek architecture, which is mainly the Renaissance, around 1500, 1500, and the classicism around 1800 after Christ, as you will learn later probably in the later lessons. but. In these two times, one 500 years ago from now and one 200 years ago, they reused the system, and this is kind of the system that they use. So the, the column, uh, the Corinthian, they made a bit slimmer, one to ten, so it looks more elegant, but on the other hand, not so strong. And the last one would be composite, so it's composition of the Ionian capital together with the Corinthian acanthus leaves. And then they made also the the entablature are always more rich, but it's always a variation of the Ionic one from where's today Turkey. So it just become same elements, just adding more and make it more rich, but not really your own design of the entablature. So that's the top part, right? The horizontal part. So and this is how he worked, how he how he made the system. There are actually many, many people who wrote books how actually this architecture looks like. And the first one that we know is called Vitruvius. That's the very left one. That's the only guy who wrote an architecture theory book, how to build classic... Uh, uh, sorry, that's not the only guy who wrote it, but the only book that remains. So there, there were many more. And he was an engineer working in the Roman Empire around, I think, 50 after Christ or something. So around the year zero somehow, 2,000 years ago. And that's the only book that's preserved because in the, in the Middle Ages they copied it in the monastery, so they copy the books, and it's the only one that we have. There were more. And that's the column how he described how it will look like. No base and Doric. This is now the Doric order. And then from 1500 after Christ, roughly, there were quite many people who, who wrote their own books about architecture. And they usually called, the one from Vitruvius was called 10 books about architecture. It's more like 10 chapters in one book, but he called it 10 books, and that's why there were many architects like wrote 10 books or 8 books or 5 books about architecture, and they always call it like that, 10 books, 5 books, and it's usually one book with different chapters. So, and, and there you see the names of the architects who suggest how this Doric order can look like. So you see Palladio, the famous architect in the middle, where I show some of the buildings already before. This is now around 1500, and then later Gibbs is, I think, 19th century already. Um, British, so the, they, they changed the proportion. And he summarized that into, into that one, into slide five, so the, 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 the ideal version. But this is how the different architects suggest how it can be designed. Doric, here Ionian, they, have, they are slimmer, right? One, one to nine, the height. This is all in the book that I upload. You can have a look through. And this is the, then the highest, the Corinthian, or with a, with, a, with a volute, you call it composite. So they make it usually 1 to 10. So if you make it slimmer, you can also make columns even 1 to 11 or 1 to 12, but it looks too thin, kind of. It looks a bit too fragile. So between 1, and, 1 to 8 and 1 to 10 
it looks both elegant and still like stable enough because it's all built in stone right it will break if you make thinner yeah so this is how it works and this is then the system how the proportion work the right one is, is kind of the beam system but actually it's enough when you understand these proportions in detail but without whiteboard i really can't show you it always starts with the lower with the lower column diameter and then you see it, it reaches one to usually 85 percent of the width and the uh, and temperature is usually 20 25 percent of the the height so that means that the diameter varies between 175 in the tuscan two in the ionian and so but but the, the compared to the height it's always the same so the entablature is usually 25 percent of the height of the column on top so if you scale them i i, I scanned that one and scaled it in an archicad before and actually it's always kind of the same it's always 25 percent of the height it looks harmonic to the the column height 25 percent height of the column on top is the entablature and usually 30 percent under it if you want to base the high one there yeah and then it's it's about the, the distances between columns so the, the famous one the vitruvius that i said this is the only book that's remained he suggests different column distances that's the top left side because the appearance of the building become very different based on the distances. And so he gave them Latin names, so the narrow one. Then I think that's, that's the first one on the left is, I think, two. two. It's always lower diameter, always the lower diameter of the beginning of the column. It's distance two. Then you see, I think, 2.5. And then he has the third one called oistulos, that means beautiful. Oi is something like, yeah, it, it's, it's a prefix it, it describing something positive or beautiful. So, uh, if you can't hear me or something, say something, right? Or can't see the slide. So, I'm now on slide 10. So, Oistulos mean beautiful, and this is actually 3.25 lower diameter in the distance. So, you see the middle one he made bigger already, and in the, in the case too, if you want to emphasize the entrance but the normal oistulus is just the distance of 3.25 lower diameters that looks harmonic to him for public yeah mostly public buildings and then it become wider and wider diostulus i think four and then the last one should be five or 5.5 erostulus eros mean air so i think this is already like it doesn't really look good anymore so oistulus 3.25 you found perfect and here the the robert chitam drawn different ones for the styles, Tuscan on the top, Ionian comes next because of the organization on that on that paper, and um, and so on. So you see the, the 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 effect is really like strongly, how you say, strongly changes with the distance of the columns to each other. So one is the proportion of the column itself. The second the <coughs> the entablature on top how it's how the proportion is and the third one is the distances of the columns that has a big effect so this is our all regarding columns so and now here starts the architecture why here because so here he integrates arc so this happened earliest in roman empire and here he draws system uh, how you can integrate an, an arc and then the column becomes just a application on the front so it doesn't have static function anymore it doesn't carry the entablature so on slide 10 you see it carry it really carries the forces it brings the forces down from the roof and the ground here it really becomes like a decoration but we call it tectonically because tectonic means showing the forces in the building on the outside there's a tectonic architecture that's untectonic this is architecture does not show the forces bring into the ground and for example, Zaha Hadid buildings, they kind of, I would say, like pretend to fly or they say it look, it look like flying. So that doesn't intentionally, I mean, they do it intentionally, they intentionally do not want to show the forces. They want to, I would say, pretend there, there are no forces or we, we have beaten or conquered the forces. And tectonic architecture is architecture that shows the forces that factually work in the building parts in the facade or in the outside can be the inner facade and the room but mostly it's the outer facade on the building so and if you do these columns like this you can put a full column but sometimes just a half column 
on the front or even what they call pilaster, like a very thin one, just to show what happens in the wall. So the wall can be bricks and could work without these kind of columns or half columns, but you put them in front to show the forces inside called tectonic. Yeah, and so this is how the Romans did it. They used it as a, as a system and that's why now they call it order also, Doric order, because it orders the facade. You will see in a second how it, it creates the order system. So that's now about facades. Later, we also talk about floor plans. You have mainly always this, right? Floor plans and facades, and both want to be organized. So this, this kind of order orders the proportion of the facade. Starts with the, that one. If you add the bases, they become everything slimmer. So you can, uh, you can do both, right? I mean, they also did both. In Roman Empire, they did this one, slide 11 without the base, slide 12 with the base. You can also add on top another balustrade. They do it if you practically have a balcony. So, and they, and they give proportion for that too. So the main one is still the column, then the entablature, then you can add the bases under it, based on which style you use. They become slimmer, because the Corinthian one is kind of more elegant and slim, so the base is also slimmer. And also the, the balustrade on top becomes more elegant and slim, but for the Corinthian one, it has the two circles inside. You see already, it's maybe everything too fragile and very thin. So if you use the base, I find the Doric one better. Maybe the you. I think the Doric is the best for that one. And the Corinthian <coughs> already becomes quite fragile, but it's still the same system. It starts with the Greek temple, right? It's a, this is in this case, it's an elevation system. It's not, not a big impact. It has a little impact on the floor plan, but it doesn't design a floor plan yet, but an elevation. And here you see how they actually then make buildings. It. So the, the book works systematically the classic orders of architecture of Robert Chittam. So this is what they did in the Roman Empire. And the Greek, not so they started in the Greek, but the Romans then, then uh, yeah, added them onto each other. So the hierarchy was given, as I said, Tuscan is the lowest, then Dorian, then Ionic, then Corinthian. So here you see on the left side, Ionic is over the Dorian. And you see in the proportion already, when you start with the base, Base has one, right? Diameter one. The upper part, 85 persons, so 0.85. Then the second one, you start with 0.85, and you have to slim it again on 15 person to keep the proportion. Otherwise, it look weird. Sometimes when architects don't understand it, like in America, also the current houses, they sometimes want to build it, and they can't. They make it wrong, and they make the column straight, like one, one, one to one. It looks really weird. So you make it slimmer to look actually more, yeah, it's just like more beautiful and looks like more tectonic. So, and then on, on, on the Ionic one on the top of the Doric, you start with 0.85 and then you reach something like 0.62 something because you reduce 15% of the width. And then also the entablature becomes slimmer. So when you continue on with the third one, like for example, the Colosseum in Rome, you start with 0.65 and then you reach, I think, 0.5 something. So it's just half of a diam diameter on the ground of the building. So that that but that influenced the facade. That's why it's called order again. So it's a principle how to structure the facade. And here you see all elements added on in the in the big two arcs. So it has a basis, it has a column, it has an entablature, the Doric one, and then the basis for the columns on the second floor integrate the balustrade that can be also seen as a top. Of the lower one so you can read the, these balustrades this kind of yeah balustrade you you could read it as as a part of the lower one like a like a crown on top or you can read a part of the basis of the second floor so and of course you can add a roof on everything in the end you can add a roof but you don't have to you can also end it like flat they're both examples yeah and then you see how you can add like columns in different distances so this is a system for facades and this is how they did it. So this is, for example, the Roman Colosseum. It would be, it's a brick, a brick building and it could stand by itself without these column systems. But they use, as you can see, the columns just as half columns in front, but they use it to clarify the proportion. So as you see, the, the, the columns there, it starts, now maybe I should zoom in a bit more in that slide. The, but here in MS Teams, I cannot zoom. So the lowest one is the Doric, then comes entablature and and basis for the second one, also the, the balustrade, which covers this high volume that they have to, to, to build the second floor. So kind of they, they have these kind of dome-like ceilings behind it. 
and actually they they need this height to 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 cover the construction area. I mean, this, and, 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 uh, in the section, it's a, it's a dome, right? To to carry the second floor, and then ionic order and corinthian on top and then they're still not done and they add something like a composite on top but very slim so to make like a large heavy crown it looks already over heavy because they actually didn't keep the proportion that would be logical for the next one they make it higher because they needed the function so it looks like a very heavy crown it looks actually unproportioned so the first three levels make everything right it's like ideal and then the last one makes it kind of wrong and that makes it like a very heavy crown you see the kind of a, a mistake already and here this is a reconstructed facade of a library these are the original elements but i think it's in ephesus and uh, so they used the original elements to rebuild it it's a facade of a library from the roman empire and this is a re i mean computer reconstruction so you see how creative do you can use it so here you have two times a composite so two times the highest order and you see already the column on the top is smaller right it's because it starts with a lower diameter so it starts with 0.85 and ends 0.62 of the ground floor diameter and becomes slimmer otherwise you can also try to draw it in archicad and do it same but you will find the second one looks too heavy same when you try to draw them all with diameter one then it looks like some wrong american countryside houses so it, it just doesn't look good it's not a rule you have to follow but it's just like as i said perfectionism they tried it over centuries how it looks good <clears throat> and this is what the human eye sees as more most harmonic so it's not a fixed rule you can try everything every variation you want there's no law about it but that's just what they discovered in classic in the classic time called classic greek time what looks the most harmonic to a human eye so that's why the the columns and the second floor are slimmer and you see how var variations you can make like coming front of the facade going back adding these kind of edicular so these small roofs on the top like a roundish roof a triangle roof so it was a facade for a library like that in ephesus and you see how how rich they elaborated so with these colors and colored marble but it's still a greek system used in the roman empire like around I think 100 something after Christ, so 300 years after the Greek temples, roughly, or a bit more. But they use the same system and make it like a rich architecture. So this building is from around 1500, so that's much later. <clears throat> but I just put it as a church in France, somewhere in Paris, because they used again in the Renaissance time, that's around 1500, 1500 before Christ. They go back to the Greek architecture, and here you see how free you can use it to structure the facade. So start with a doric on the ground second floor is ionic because seen a bit lighter or more feminine and the third the corinthian uh, the highest on the top and you see how free they use it like front and back and only two columns together it's not like in a temple column 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 and how they do like arcs and and statues in the in the gaps and how they do the doors on the ground one with the arc coming out another temple element over the main door right the big one behind the tree now two small doors so they proportion the start very freely but they use the greek element so it's a unique design right the architect sort of a design two floors and then another roof roof floor kind of a facade for the roof that's behind that the third floor and how free they can use it but it's based on the greek architecture so you see how capable it is to actually cover any kind of facade you want and order it that's why they call it order so it makes a proportion system be behind it or in front of it so and here that's that's now the kind of the most important papers on in that book pages in, in that book from robert chitham so here he, he did like british style sorry townhouses like putting the order just as a as a facade proportion and now i think the important one is actually it's slide 19 so here he keep the columns away so you see the proportion system is still there two houses right on the top and on on the bottom but the columns are gone so i'm not meaning there's small columns around the door you could ignore that that's another one but the whole facade for example the house on the on the on the top side has a proportion a system and it comes from the columns but the columns are taken away so it still works the proportion system still works even when you take away the main elements which are the columns right so slide 18 you see the same look on the on the picture on the top the facade with the columns 
and slide 19 on the top is the same house, just taking the columns away. So it still works to, to give a system in the facade. And then the system that, that uh, uh, was developed there is kind of the basis and then the main body of the house, the main part and this top. And this actually stayed through the 19th century as a, as a grammar, as a grammar for architecture. And that's why the cities look so unique in 19th century in Europe, because that's well, when, when, when tourists go there, also beautiful, because it has this kind of system behind it. Even when you take the columns away, the system still works, because it's a proportion system that I tried to explain you now. And the whole cities in 19th century, until modern architecture, looked very unique, even if the buildings were from different architects, from different areas and different times, like different centuries even they match together because of this kind of grammar it's a grammar same like language is also bound together by a grammar and then you can exchange the vocabulary but the grammar remains in the language so and that's same about this kind of architecture that goes back to the greek architecture and gives a system for the facade so this slide 19 i think the top side you really i mean i really understood how it works it, it's a proportion system okay Go back to Greek architecture. So and now it's already 11.35, so I will go big briefly through this one. It's the second book I uploaded. It's a very huge one. I think it has 800 pages, but I uploaded only the short text part, which is actually about the work of an architect, how it should be. I mean, it's written there by the professor. And, and then the so-called graphic tables, so the, the graphic drawings. This book that you see the cover, uploaded in MS Teams. And you can download the whole one for free somewhere if you want. It's 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 all online. It's one of the most important architecture books for the 19th century. When the when these, as I said, these new building forms like hospitals, train stations were built in 19th century after in the where's his name written in the middle? J. N. L. Durand means Jean Nicolas Louis Durand. He was an architect, but he was not famous as architect. He didn't really build anything, or just one or two buildings. But he was a professor in the first architecture faculty in Paris, written there, big Paris. And the title is Précis des Leçons. That means summary of the lectures of architecture. So the title Précis des Leçons means summary of the lessons of architecture. So he published the book and he lectured about architecture in that way. And many famous actually like every important architects even from germany that time went to paris and germany had like a peak of that architecture uh, to see his lectures so they, they traveled to paris to visit his lectures and he was a famous professor not everybody loved what they saw so it was like a discussion should we do like that or not but he found a system how to use this classic architecture going back to greek in a quite free way and already this very systematic so it's actually a, a ancestor of the modern Bauhaus systems was by the systemization of architecture and he he was the first one doing it around 1800 1800 after Christ and this actually is also in the floor plan so if you look through these tables you will you don't have to understand the details but you will understand the system it's all built on grids so you see the same house facades in different versions and this is this this book here is the column system again. Like he start, I think, with the Greek Doric, and how he how he go through Greek Doric, Roman Doric, Ionic, uh, Corinthian compo composition, composite order, and he 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 make it to a system. You see, like you, you say, you can use all systems in a building, but that's a proportion system. It's different from Chitham. I think Chitham's is a bit better. It's not so formal for the facade proportions. But this guy is good because he, I mean, you will not design a building exactly like this, but, but it shows like how systems work. Like, for example, you can make a tower high in the middle and low in the ground. You can make high at the corners and so on. So this was the most modern approach that time to building design. And you can actually find nearly all buildings from 19th century in this book, like as a system. So they, he, he, so this is about facades. He developed system to use this classic architecture. Here it's about facades. And here it becomes very smart. I find like proportions built on this for floor plans now. So you can see he tried to cover everything. I don't know if he covered anything, but always like when it's, when it's rectangular, 
surrounded by four by three by two sides divided by you see i go from the left to the right divided by two divided by four but so it's really this this plan is already so great it's like a totally systematic development of floor plan forms overall ones of course you will elaborate them but i assume every house you can find on the world will fit somehow in this system even the contemporary ones you will f fit it in these principles. So the book is all about design principles. That's why it was so abstract and modern. And here it's where the columns, nowadays you don't build the columns so much, but you see, still see systems like in the front and the front around. And you, and you will have that also for contemporary architecture. When you have like an open space, you will not do the Greek columns currently, but, but you will have an open space and a closed space, outside, inside. So how it's related and how the walls partly surround the outside space. You find all options in this book, I believe. You can't find, I, I believe you will not find one house that doesn't fit in these systems. Of course, in another interpretation currently, but the systems are all given in that book. Here's staircases, so they are more classic, but I like these. So he already thought like, how can we make stairs? Going this, going this, going this, going this. When you, for example, when your, ha your house, your, you will also have some stairs going to the second floor in your Friday, like Friday design class. You can actually have a look how to do stairs. So it's different ways. I, I know you will not do it so classic like in a, in, a, in a palace, but the systems are the same also in contemporary and modern architecture. So it's all about systems. He developed on squares and but, but, but become bigger. So you should have a look through, not to understand this. I mean, you will not design a floor plan probably like that, but it's, 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 it's about principles, right? How how, how something can surround the courtyard or courtyards around the house or like it's what I said on, on last Friday or it's an L shape or it's a U shape. So you find all these kind of shapes also for modern architecture in this book. Here's a very big one, but you see how he used the square as a basic element for floor plans, the square. And, and yeah, this is from that time. Boulet is an architect. He used these systems to create facade. This one was real, but it's unfortunately destroyed like 50 years ago. It was a hotel in Paris. That's how it looked or oh, this one is still preserved so this architect from the same time like durand this hotel in paris is, is preserved so that's that's a classicistic architecture right but even without the decorative elements which are from the past the system is still the same like in this book so it's used so that's why i invite you to have a look through that book